Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Vandenberg series on the future of conservative farm policy. Uh, in this series, we explore the varied approaches to farm policy among the conservative national security community, examining the fault lines and creating a space for serious debate and discussion. Um, over the past several weeks, we have welcomed Dr. Colin Duick and Will Inbiden, both members of the Vandenberg Advisory Board, who provided an overview of the history of conservative farm policy up to the present day. Uh, we are now moving to the part of our series that includes discussions with several grant strategists uh, involved in shaping U.S. national security policy in the last administration. And today we are delighted to welcome another member of the Vandenberg Advisory Board, uh, Dr. Peter Berkowitz, who is Director of Policy Planning at the State Department from 2019 to 2021, and is a current senior fellow with the Hoover Institution. Uh, the policy planning staff within the State Department is the Grand Strategy Center uh, for every presidential administration. And I know Peter has many thoughts to share on this subject and potentially many others. Um, as a reminder to our audience, we will uh, accept questions from the audience towards the end of the discussion today. So you can feel free to submit those questions uh, through the Q&A option below. Uh, and through the chat. Uh, so without further delay, I'd like to turn it over to Peter to make a few opening remarks on his vision for the future of conservative foreign policy, as well as for our discussion today, and then we'll dive right into the interview. So Peter, thanks so much for, for being here today. Well, thank you, Amanda. Uh, it's great to be with you. I want to thank uh, Vandenberg for hosting this and to say uh, how terrific it is to have a conversation with a former colleague on the policy planning staff, <laughs> you, uh, a former member there. Um, you invited me to open up with a few remarks, and I thought it might be of, uh, of interest to uh, relate uh, how it is that I came to be uh, head of the policy planning staff, because um, I did not, I'm not really, I was not really a foreign policy uh, professional. On the other hand, uh, I wasn't entirely surprised when I received a call in September 2018 from the then head of policy planning. Um, uh, telling me that Secretary Pompeo was looking for somebody on the policy planning staff who could uh, focus on the question of Israel. I wasn't surprised that I was being called because on the one hand, um, uh, well, the main reason is that for uh, 15 previous years, I had been traveling on a regular basis to uh, Israel four or five times a year to uh, host events, to teach, to, to, to report and had learned a fair amount about history, culture, politics, national security in Israel. Um, so when I, I, I was told that Secretary Pompeo was looking for somebody who could advise him on Israel, uh, I said, that's important, that's terrific. Give me, give me two days and I'll provide you a list. Uh, I was a bit surprised when the reply came back, no, we'd like you. Uh, I said, well, um, I'm very flattered, but that's impossible. Busy, uh, not a foreign policy professional, um, got many different tasks, but um, I was told, well, you could do it part-time. You can come in on the, uh, IP as an IPA Intergovernmental Personnel Act. And to make a long story short, I eventually uh, accepted the flattering offer. I joined the policy planning staff in January of 2019. As a part-time member, and my purpose was to advise on Israel, provide the secretary independent judgment, a larger view consistent with um, the task of the policy planning staff, focus on uh, Israel. About six months later, um, uh, the, uh, the then head of the policy plan staff was dismissed and Secretary Pompeo asked me to uh, take over the policy planning staff. Uh, I, I accepted. This meant a dramatic transformation uh, in, my, in my responsibilities. Not only was I now head of the office, but um, my, my focus shifted from Israel, which was a, a priority for the Trump administration, to being responsible for an office, Amanda, as you said, that had to address um, the, the questions of grand strategy, the, the wide variety of issues that America faces around the world. Um, and I'll go on for just a, another minute or so in, in, in this vein. I think I did what uh, many uh, new heads of policy planning do. Uh, I, I returned to George Kennan's uh, long telegram written from Moscow in 1946, 
addressing the question put to him by uh, his bosses in the State Department, what do we do about the Soviet Union? Um, now I read that, by the way, in light of um, a project that I inherited from Secretary, uh, that, I, that I inherited from my predecessor on the policy planning staff, and in light of a project uh, I knew I was going to initiate in light of Secretary Pompeo's priorities. Um, as Secretary Pompeo's priority by the time I joined the policy planning staff in 2019, I think this is the best way to put it, his priority was to reorient American foreign policy around the China challenge. So I knew the policy planning staff had to, uh, had to make that our focus, whether we were writing for the secretary about making recommendations about Africa, about Europe, about the Middle East, about South America, um, uh, about the Indo-Pacific, China, China was at the center. Um, and I also had a project I inherited, I mentioned, this was the work of the Commission on Unalienable Rights. Now, I'll close with these opening remarks here, I learned, um, I took three important lessons away from my rereading of Kennan's long telegram. Kennan um, simply ignores what had become a great debate in international relations. As a, uh, as a scholar of international relations, you, Dr. Rothschild, know that um, there is a great debate about whether we students of foreign relations ought to study interests and power and the, the, the logic of the global chessboard or whether we ought to study ideas and international institutions. Kennan was clear, study interests and power and study ideas if you want to understand the Soviet Union. The second point he made was to understand Soviet conduct, you have to understand the interplay of, of both Marxism, Leninism, and traditional Russian nationalism. And third, if America was going to prevail in the great contest uh, with the Soviet Union, it was very important, one, for America to straight, stay true to its fundamental principles, and second, for America to launch uh, a, uh, uh, a new commitment to education in foreign affairs around especially Russian language, Chinese language, and culture, and history, and politics, because there was no way we'd be in a position to prevail unless we understood better what we were, uh, were up against. So, um, those elements of the long telegram, which um, led more or less to the formation of the Office of the Policy Planning Staff, those lessons from Kennan uh, helped me as, uh, as, um, as I took over policy planning. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for, for those remarks. I'd, um, I'd like to stay on the topic of the China Challenge report, if, if we could, for a moment. Um, I, you mentioned the, the interplay between ideas and interests in reviewing some of Kennan's work, and I know that had a particularly salient role as well in the China Challenge Report. Um, your findings on Marxism and Leninism, for instance, as well as nationalism, I think caused a little bit of controversy perhaps, and maybe you could elaborate a bit more on what was most controversial in that report and what were the objections and how did you respond to them? Yes, happy to, happy to do so. And, um... And I, I, and I should underscore, as, as you know well, the, um, the elements of the China Challenge is a, is a policy planning uh, paper. Uh, everybody in policy planning uh, uh, contributed. Um, uh, it was really, a, really a, t a team effort. And I should mention really um, uh, the first task I assigned in policy planning, I signed actually with the, um, the crucial assistance of, my, of the deputy for policy, our friend Mike Urena, we sent, around, um, we sent around a request to every member of the policy planning staff to write a short, uh, short report, three to five pages. This may have been just before you, you joined us from the NSC um, uh, to, and examine the role of China in your area of the world. We got back something amazing. Um, in every region and in every functional era, era our colleagues, had a lot to say about Chinese inroads, about Chinese schemes of economic co-optation, co uh, 
coercion, about Chinese diplomacy, about uh, Chinese efforts to transform international organizations with, within. But uh, few people knew about what was happening in other regions, in, in other functional eras, areas. And, and in general, as, uh, as we reviewed the writings about China, we, we developed the impression that while some people focused on the Indo-Pacific, others focused on China and their area, um, few people fully appreciated the scope of the cha China challenge, which was, uh, which was a global challenge. Um, I, I'm gonna come to, to the question about what was most controversial, but I wanna want provide just a little more context before I do. Um, uh, so some of our, our distinctive findings, or findings is not exactly the right word because our aim in the elements of the China challenge was not so much to break new ground, provide a, a kind of synthesis of, uh, of scholarship that was already out there, of work that had already been done by our colleagues in the, uh, in the Trump administration, including uh, important writings that had come from the uh, National Security and Council, including the National Security uh, uh, paper by, uh, uh, by H.R. McMaster and writings by our colleague, uh, led by, by Matt Pottinger. So we wanted to bring it all together and state as clearly as possible what did we want to state? We wanted to state first that uh, China is no ordinary status quo power that merely seeks preeminence in the established international order. China is a revisionist power. It wants a new kind of international order, an order with Beijing at the center, and an order that uh, instead of the one we have that is friendly to free uh, and sovereign nation states, they want an order that's more friendly to authoritarian states. China proceed to, to understand its conduct. We emphasize it's very important to appreciate that uh, China is a Marxist-Leninist dictatorship. By the way, not my words, their words, um, that it is uh, horribly repressive of, it, of its people, um, that, uh, that it engages, as I've mentioned, in schemes of economic co-optation and coercion around the world, and it attempts to, trans it attempts to transform international institutions within uh, and very importantly, it has built a world-class military. Um, we go on to point out that nevertheless, you cannot understand China's conduct in the South China Sea, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, all the way around the world without understanding two sets of ideas that merge and in shaping uh, the policies of the Chinese Communist Party. I haven't mentioned the Chinese Communist Party yet, but of course, the Chinese Communist Party governs uh, the People's Republic of China. What are these two streams of ideas? I've mentioned Marxism, Leninism. I should also mention a kind of hyper Chinese nationalism. Marxism, Leninism provides a kind of schema for governance. But there's nothing in Marxism, Leninism that says, for example, that Hong Kong uh, always has been and always must be part of China. Nothing in Marxism, Leninism that grants uh, China uh, sovereignty over uh, the South China Sea, God knows how, how far out. Nothing in Marxism, Leninism that says that Taiwan always has been, <clears throat> excuse me, and must remain uh, a, a part of China. Those ideas, those convictions, and the idea that Beijing must be at the center of uh, international order, all well, that springs from a certain interpretation of Chinese nationalism. The paper also emphasizes vulnerabilities of China. Um, some of those are endemic to authoritarian powers, like um, the, the difficulties in uh, innovating, correcting for your weaknesses because you crush dissent, the difficulty in forming and maintaining alliances, and the costs of repression at home. We go through, as you know, the vulnerabilities that are specific to China, beginning with economic stability, we know China is an economic powerhouse. People overlook that while it has the world's largest middle class, it also has uh, still approximately 600 million people. It's almost twice the United States who live on approximately $140 a month. That can produce economic instability. There's also um, climate degradation, a demographic uh, a ticking time bomb, uh, questions about succession, and the damage to China's reputation from uh, its cover up of of COVID-19. And finally, um, our recommendations for securing freedom. These run from 
uh, restoring, uh, strengthening constitutional government at home, ensuring we have the mightiest, uh, most supple, most technologically sophisticated army uh, in, in the world. As you know, because you worked on this, rethinking our alliance system, what was um, what helped us win the Cold War may not be uh, may not be best suited to um, uh, uh, to dealing with the China challenge, and, and we also call on the United States to uh, the United States government to invest in uh, in the study of Chinese language, actually Russian language, Arabic, Persian, and more for the better understanding of uh, of the challenges we face. Most controversial, as you mentioned. Uh, I, the role of ideas. I'm going to give you one example. Just uh, just two weeks ago, I was on a podcast with some experts on China, and I was uh, reproached gently, but nevertheless reproached after my op opening remarks for referring to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, what's the problem? And the problem was that that's, quote, inflammatory, unquote, I should refer to the Chinese government. Now, in one sense, that's right. It is inflammatory to refer to the Chinese Communist Party because in the minds of decent and uh, informed people, that will evoke memories of the atrocities that communist governments committed in the 20th century. Those governments were responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of their own people, say nothing of, uh, of, uh, of other people. But of course, uh, it is not I, it was not the policy planning staff and it was not Secretary Pompeo who invented this as, a, as an insult. Xi Jinping is only too proud to insist that he is the head of the Chinese Communist Party. And indeed, unlike in the United States, where uh, it would be a mistake to say, um, when the United States acts on the international scene to refer to the Democratic Party doing this or the Republican Party doing this, uh, that's because we have a government in which one party may be in control for a time and another uh, for, uh, after that. For the CCP, the, the Chinese Communist Party is a party that has a government which it controls. So uh, that was what most con controversial, but, um, but I think we are correct. Um, yes, th thanks Peter for that, that in-depth summary of the, of the report. Um, do you think the Biden team has accepted any of your recommendations? Why or why not? Um, they have touted this idea of a foreign policy for the middle class and the Trump administration. One of our priorities was to ensure that the interests of the American people came first. Could you comment a bit on whether any of your recommendations in relation to China have been uh, continued and how you would respond to um, their idea of a foreign policy for the middle class as you've written on this quite extensively? Um, as, as you may know, within approximately 90 minutes of, of Joe Biden's inauguration, um, the, uh, the State Department removed from the policy planning uh, website, web page, both the report of the Commission on Unalienable Rights and our paper, the Puzzle Plan Step paper, the elements of the China challenge. On February 4th, a few weeks after his inauguration, President Biden did give uh, what was touted as a major foreign policy speech. And that speech in a way addresses both of your questions. There was some tough rhetoric about China in that speech. Um, President Biden spoke of China as a strategic challenger he spoke of an authoritarian moment we are now facing. Uh, uh, and he, he identified China as the preeminent foreign policy challenge. <clears throat> I think um, all that represents a dramatic change for the Democratic Party, a dramatic change, that rhetoric from the, um, from the time of the Obama administration, they did speak of a pivot to, uh, a pivot to Asia. But this language is language that grows out of, I think, that reorientation of American foreign policy, which was particularly led, I think, by, by Secretary Pompeo, in which uh, you and I had the honor of, uh, of assisting with. Um, th that said, um, I, I don't believe that the... Um, the, the actions and the measures of the Biden administration have adequately afflect, 
have adequately reflected that that good language. There is bipartisan support in Congress for a tough stance toward China, but I think the administration could do do a lot more. Let's talk about one, uh, from my point of view, highly problematic error era, highly problematic area. Um, in the last days of the Trump administration, Secretary Pompeo issued an official sec, uh, State Department determination that uh, the People's Republic of China, under the direction and control of the Chinese Communist Party, was engaging in crimes against humanity and genocide against the Turkic Muslims, the Uyghurs of uh, Xinjiang, Northwest China. Secretary Blinken affirmed the, that determination. And yet the United States has sent, uh, sent a delegation of athletes to, uh, uh, to compete in the Olympics in China. Uh, yes, we have uh, imposed a diplomatic boycott, um, but my guess is that Xi Jinping does not miss American diplomats in China and is delighted uh, to uh, have American athletes competing there. Uh, and I'm very concerned about the signals we send, uh, by the way, not only around the world, but to fellow Americans about the seriousness of a determination of genocide when we, uh, in nevertheless, in, uh, in competing in the, the uh, Olympic games. On the question of um, a foreign policy for the middle class, uh, um, having studied the matter, uh, I've come to the conclusion that it is hokey it is a hokey and divisive notion that it's uh, mere rhetoric. Now, Biden, um, Biden did, did cite um, the, uh, foreign policy for the middle class in his February 4th speech. His national security, uh, national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, had written about it. Uh, then his head of policy planning um, presided over a long policy paper, I think from uh, Carnegie, but I'm not sure on foreign policy for the middle class. But really, um, uh, I am not aware of um, strong desire among the middle class to revive the JCPOA, to exit Afghanistan by the summer of, um, by the summer of uh, uh, 2021, uh, to, um, uh, um, uh, to equivocate about um, about our role in uh, in standing by, uh, by by Ukraine, I'm not aware of um, any desire by the by the middle class to uh, to encourage the the Soviets to complete the Nord Stream two pipeline, which will make Western Europe even more dependent on um, on Russian natural gas, and I'm certainly not aware of any middle class interest in uh, canceling the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, I think that, uh, that the, um, the Biden people saw that Donald Trump um, attracted voters by saying American immigration policy, um, trade policy, climate policy, and some national security policy was hurting America and in particular hurting the middle class. And Trump said he would change those policies. And Trump did change policies on immigration. He did negotiate different trade deals. He did uh, engage in some reorientation abroad. He did take us out of um, Paris, uh, Paris climate accords. Climate accords, by the way, it would have done next to nothing uh, to limit uh, hydrocarbon emissions from the world's number one polluter, that is the People's Republic of China, which is responsible for something like 30% of, uh, of such, such emissions. But as I've already suggested, um, it seems to me if one looks at both the promise of a, a, middle, uh, a foreign policy for the middle class and the reality of the policies, what we see is something actually cynical, that is a desire to harvest middle-class votes while retaining progressive policies that are unpopular with the middle class. I'll make one more last point here. 
Um, I, I said that a foreign policy for the middle class is divisive. It's divisive because it implies it benefits one class at the expense of uh, other classes. Trump understood, uh, and I think this is right, that it's uh, unfair to ask any one class to shoulder a disproportionate um, amount of burdens for, for American foreign policy. But Donald, slow, but Donald Trump's slogan was not, make the middle class great again. Donald Trump's slogan was make America great again. And that involved policies that yes, were uh, be more beneficial to, to the middle class. I think um, our approach should be that America's purpose in foreign policy is to um, uh, better secure freedom at home by cultivating the conditions abroad friendly to uh, freedom, at, freedom at, at home. Uh, and I think if we do that, all classes in the United States will benefit. So I wanna get into these ideas a little bit more, but first I, I do wanna remind our audience that they can submit questions um, at any point during the discussion to the chat or to the Q&A box. Um, and we will collect those and ask them uh, later during the interview. So please feel free at any time to send those in as they come to you. Um, so Peter, on this idea about a foreign policy for the middle class, one of the um, driving motivations for this series is finding a way to distinguish between liberal foreign policy, as we might conceive it, and conservative foreign policy, because in a domestic setting, it seems easier to make those distinctions. Um, what do you think about this idea of a conservative foreign policy? What does it mean to you to have a big tent uh, in the conservative community on national security? Well, as, as you know, Amanda, there is a controversy has arisen within conservative circles themselves about what it is to be an American conservative. What, what does conservatism mean? Um, in my judgment, the best way to answer that question uh, is to ask, what is it that you wish to conserve? Um, when I review American foreign policy from, um, from George Washington's farewell address through the 19th century, the 20th, 20th century and into the 21st century, I see, um, uh, not always consistently, but over and over, um, one particular good that, uh, that we seek to conserve. And again, I repeat what I said a moment ago. Um, we seek to conserve, we seek to secure American freedom. Uh, in Washington's era, that counseled minding our own business and staying out of those that those authoritarian power politics, the authoritarian power politics that the Europeans were engaged in. A generation later, James Monroe said, well, to secure freedom at home, we've got to pay a little bit more attention to the world. We, we, we need to insist that the Europeans not bring their authoritarian and divisive ways to, um, to, to this hemisphere. Um, to make a long story short, uh, as the world grew smaller, and American economy grew more entangled with the world. Um, America had to pay more attention to the world in order to secure, secure freedom at home. It seems to me, uh, yeah, uh, conservatives are in the business of conservating, we should conserve freedom. Uh, my own view is that all Americans should be devoted to this, uh, this task of securing freedom. So what does that mean, however, for foreign policy? Um, Again, I say, I don't say secure freedom around the entire world, but we should, uh, we should always be asking ourselves when we're engaging in diplomacy and we're addressing questions of national security, how does this secure freedom at home? I think um, specifically conservatives have actually much to learn from the variety of schools, which is why um, to anticipate a possible other question you might ask, I'm in favor of a bigger tent. What, what do I mean by that? Um, it seems to me the several schools of foreign policy that compete for our attention um, are all incomplete, but each has something important to uh, teach those of us who think, uh, who, who want to focus on securing American freedom at home. Uh, we learn a lot from the realists, as I've mentioned, about the role of interest, about the role of power, about the geopolitical chessboard. Um, we learn a lot from, uh, from the neoconservative tradition, in my judgment, from the role of ideas influencing regimes, uh, the, importance of, uh, the importance of strength 
in achieving peace and the role of considerations of justice, which are not the only consideration, but, but an important consideration for foreign policy today. Um, the language that we use to speak about justice in foreign affairs is the language of uh, human rights. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, Americans spoke of unalienable rights, hence the commission that uh, Secretary Pompeo created. From the liberal internationalists, we learn about the role of um, international organizations in advancing into American interest. And I, but I have to immediately add, and from the realists and from the neoconservatives, we learn how easily international organizations be, can, can be captured by, um, by elites, by bureaucrats, and in the international system can be made to serve uh, interests that are contrary to America's interest in maintaining a free and open uh, international order. So, um, so in my judgment, the over, overriding consideration of foreign policy is securing freedom at home. And in doing that, um, uh, I think we have, um, ha have something to learn to, to, from uh, the diversity of schools of foreign policy out there. So two questions come to mind based on those comments. First is, would you consider yourself a part of a particular camp? Um, and if you don't wanna answer that, that's okay too. And my, uh, my second question is whether these schools of thought have any resonance with the American people and what is their role in determining yeah. the future of conservative foreign policy, if so, and if not? Yeah, so I, so I don't know um, if, I'm, uh, uh, if I belong to any of the camps we, we've mentioned so far. I'm not sure if any, any of them would have me, but, if you, uh, but, but it would be pusillanimous to, um, uh, to, to not give myself uh, any sort of designation. So how about this one? Constitutional conservative, since, since it's the approach to foreign policy that, um, that I embrace and advocating is one that puts America's fundamental principles and constitutional traditions at, at, at the center. Um, uh, the, the, sorry, the second question was, so I'm wondering whether these schools of thought that we ah. often talk about, you know, in policy planning, yeah. yes. um, in some, yeah, if they have any resonance yeah. with the American yeah. people. So, and yes. Um, so I, I think um, terms like realism, neoconservatism, liberal internationalism, constructivism, I hear there's something like that in the graduate schools. I think these have next to no relevance, next to no, sorry, resonance for, uh, for the American people. On the other hand, I'm quite confident that goals like securing freedom have considerable relevance for, for the American people. If you look at opinion polls, think, think now about the, uh, the conservative side of things. If you look back at opinion polls and what motivated the Tea Party in 2010, um, by the way, the, um, uh, the election that sent um, uh, uh, a uh, relatively young congressman from Kansas to the House of Representatives, Mike Pompeo, it was limited government in freedom. And if you look at the motivations of uh, many, many Trump voters, especially middle-class voters, contrary to what you might read in the popular press, uh, a focus on freedom is, I think you'll find, high, high on their list of, uh, of considerations. Even their anger at the elite is often um, has to do with uh, either being not being disparaged or, or uh, preference to be be left alone. Uh, and by the way, we, we see this uh, significantly in um, uh, Republican voters, conservative voters responses to uh, the, uh, various of the mandates that have been imposed by the federal government uh, to respond to, to COVID-19. So uh, my own view is that uh, Speaking the language of securing freedom uh, helps us understand our foreign policy challenges better. And to he or she who will speak this language, uh, it will be helpful in explaining um, uh, to, to uh, ordinary voters their interest in the conduct of American foreign policy. Do you think this language about securing freedom is distinct from say, democracy promotion. The idea of spreading democracy has in fact become somewhat controversial on the past few years within the conservative movement. It's been linked to nation building. There's been some resistance to that and some division. 
um, within our community on those issues. So do you see securing freedom as distinct from spreading democracy or certain type of regime? Uh, it is distinct from, but it can be related to. So again, my emphasis is on securing freedom at home. And then I ask myself, what policies are, uh, are likely to make the United States more secure in a very dangerous world? Um, here's one policy, by the way, a policy that was embraced by Ronald Reagan in his 1982 Westminster speech, uh, as well as George W. Bush, as well as, uh, as, well as Harry S. Truman. Um, one policy that Reagan embraced uh, was based on the observation that uh, freer and more democratic nations are nations that uh, are not only uh, treat their citizens with greater respect, but uh, are more likely to cooperate with the United States in securing peace. I, I accept that observation is true. And now we face, excuse me, and now we face a question of um, judgment. Um, what is the United States capable of doing in any particular location in regard to any particular nation state, in regard to any particular region to promote freedom and democracy there. M my view about creating the conditions abroad, to secure freedom at home, is perfectly consistent with the conclusion that in nation state X or in region Y, there's very little that the United States can do. And that in this other region, there's a little more. And we should, we should keep in mind that the United States, as we used to say in the State Department, um, uh, has a variety of tools in its diplomatic uh, toolbox. Let me just give, give one example. Um, shortly after uh, I was named head of policy plan, I actually attended a, uh, an event at, uh, at my home institution, the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Um, Hoover was hosting a, a great figure from Hong Kong named Jimmy Lai. Jimmy Lai is a tycoon, uh, arrived in Hong Kong as a stowaway teenager, made a lot of money, opened up a newspaper, was a great champion of freedom and democracy. This was fall 2019, six months before the uh, Chinese Communist Party cracks down on freedom in, uh, in, in Hong Kong. At the end of a 30 minute interview, uh, my colleague Peter Robinson asked Jimmy Lai, um, what can the United States do to help you and your movement seeks to defend freedom and democracy in Hong Kong? And Jimmy Lai answered like this, he said, um, in Hong Kong, we don't need your tanks. And we actually don't need higher tariffs or lower tariffs um, here or there. What we need is for the United States to stop being embarrassed about American values. This is very important. And actually, since then, the problem is not so much embarrassment, but actually an attack from within the United States on, on American principles. But what Jimmy Lai said is an echo of what <coughs> dissidents in the Soviet Union told us, that Ronald Reagan's speeches, Ronald Reagan's championing of freedom provided them, uh, uh, um, uh, provided, encouraged them to stand tall, to resist and continue to, to champion freedom under terrible conditions in the, in the Soviet gulags. <clears throat> this is not the only thing that, that we can do, but we have to keep in mind that America's uh, interest in freedom and democracy around the world can be advanced in, in a variety of ways, not only by speeches, but by diplomacy, by certain kinds of foreign aid, by educational programs, but especially, especially and uh, we should call out Secretary Pompeo, who traveled around the world, forthrightly champion American principles of, uh, of freedom democracy and human rights. Um, well, thank you, Peter. At this point in the discussion, we're going to turn to some audience questions. So I'm going to read a few that we have so far. Um, one point, oh, and we have a, um, so we have a few former policy planning colleagues on, on the call today. So Mar <laughs> Martha Sims is on, and I think, I think uh, Wilson Shirley as well. So welcome to, uh, to those folks as well. Indeed. Um, so, yeah, so one question we have is, um, you made the point at the outset that you don't think of yourself as a foreign policy expert. 
Uh, what did you bring with you from your academic and legal training work that most influenced your work in the State Department? Yes, I, I, I chose my words. I said foreign policy professional. Um, um, so what, 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 what did I bring with? So first, I, I must say I brought with, um, as I mentioned, um, actually considerable experience that I had quite acquired over a decade and a half of um, Israel travels, four or five visits a year. Uh, I learned the language, I learned about the politics, I, I developed um, connections sort of across the political spectrum uh, in the uh, government and in, in national security, judiciary. So um, I, I think I brought uh, substantive knowledge about the uh, about the area that I was asked to um, uh, asked to to specialize in initially, as for the um, and then as I said, uh, owing to the um, unforeseeable contingency of events, I found myself with a bigger job and larger responsibilities. But I must say that my my training, which the questioner uh, knows, was uh, whoever it might be, just in um, in political philosophy and, and law. Was I think of, of great assistance. What what did I bring? Um, first, um, I had learned from my study of Aristotle that all serious study of politics is comparative politics. I had known for a long time uh, that if I really want to understand the American regime, uh, how the system operates, its strengths and weaknesses, I have to understand also how other liberal democracies operate their strengths and weaknesses, but I also couldn't stop there. If I really wanted to evaluate uh, United States, which was a pr uh, priority for me in my, my work as a, uh, as a scholar and as a commentator, I also had to understand authoritarian regimes because I couldn't really understand uh, the liberal and democratic alternative without understanding how authoritarian regimes work. Uh, and also what their uh, weaknesses and, and strengths were. That meant I had to read widely and I had to study uh, history, which um, I did my best, I did the best I could do in the years, uh, the many years before I entered government. I also learned from the study of uh, political philosophy, um, the importance of the regime. That is, uh, again, I tip my hat to our, uh, uh, those realist colleagues who teach us so much about interest and power. Um, uh, but you can't really understand how a nation understands it's how government officials understand interest and seek to exercise power unless you understand the form of government, that to which they look up, that in light of which they uh, lead their nations, and what, um, uh, what the people who are led uh, believe. That goes for the United States and uh, other countries. Before I entered government and because of my travels to uh, Israel um, uh, and because of the 9-11 uh, attacks, I'd become very interested in uh, questions of national security and law. In studying domestic affairs, I had become aware of what you might call the, uh, use a fancy term, the juridification of politics. That is the tendency of uh, law to steadily increase its domain and bring, increasingly bring what are what I judge to be rightly political questions, questions on which you could go uh, uh, either way, under the auspices of judges. Well, the it turns out that the juridification of politics does not stop at the water's edge. We also uh, witness to the juridification of international uh, affairs. I had written a small book called um, uh, Israel and the Struggle Over the International Laws of War. Uh, this educated me about the extent to which international law had uh, international laws of war and international human rights law had become a kind of lingua franca in which um, diplomats, especially Western diplomats, especially European <laughs> diplomats and diplomats who emerged from progressive circles in the United States, for them law had become the preferred language for um, talking about and attempting to resolve difficult, even intractable um, political questions. So this study, this training prepared me for what I encountered both in the State Department bureaucracy um, uh, and in dealing with, uh, uh, with colleagues around the world. Now just add this, the study of uh, political philosophy 
enabled me to appreciate the, the, the value of theory. This came in quite useful in the policy planning staff. Try and specify the salient questions, the key issues, the underlying norms that are affecting the issues. But um, if you're fortunate to have uh, read the books that I read, um, you would also know um, from Aristotle, from Burke, from, from many others about the limitations of theory, the importance of experience, the, um, uh, the irreducible contingency, as I've mentioned, of, of, of events. And so the need for political officials uh, to both be um, well-read in areas and have, um, have broad and solid I I experience. So um, all of that helped me out as a non-forum policy professional. Yes, absolutely. So we have a bunch of questions coming in from the audience. So I'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, one question said, uh, could, could Peter please address the critique that we can't care more about European security than the Europeans do uh, as well. For example, the German stance on, on the Ukraine situation is used as a reason to not intervene. So could you address that question? Uh, yes. Um, yes, it, it is difficult for us to care more than, uh, that, than the Europeans do. Um, that said, um, uh, we need to practice, we need to engage in diplomacy and explain to, uh, explain, explain to our allies, friends, and uh, partners in Europe the importance of uh, the Ukraine question and the importance, as, um, uh, as Harry Truman put in 1947 in his uh, address to Congress, the importance not only of the United States, but um, the free nations of the world uh, supporting other free nations that are resisting armed sub subjugation. Now, uh, what does that support look like? Uh, it's now February 2022. The, the Russians have amassed, some people say, as many as 150,000 troops uh, on, on the border with uh, Ukraine. Um, I read this morning that um, the Russians are sending uh, significant supplies of blood to the um, setting up blood banks on the border with the Ukraine. Generally, not the kind of thing you do um, as you are drawing down or engaging in uh, mere, mere exercises. So uh, we have to think about policies su suitable to this moment, not what we might have done six months ago or a year ago. Um, so I think the United States needs to be engaging in uh, intense diplomacy right now, figuring out with our friends and allies and partners, what kind of um, diplomatic assistance, financial assistance, and military assistance is is a, is appropriate to um, uh, uh, to, to uh, deliver to deliver to to the Ukrainians. Uh, that said, it's the I, apparently it is the work of diplomacy. I repeat to to explain to our European friends, some of our European friends, uh, what we regard as at stake. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, a few questions before we wrap up and then you can uh, address hopefully as many as you can uh, before the end of our session today. Um, we have uh, one question that's coming from a former policy planning staffer. Now that you've had some time to reflect uh, on your time at state, what are your thoughts on the culture and work ethic of federal government employees and how they shape policy outcomes, understanding that each agency is different and has its own uh, particular quirks? What changes would you want to see in both Fed the federal government processes as well as personnel and hiring in the civil service. Uh, and then a second, a second question is, um, in light of focusing foreign policy on securing freedom, as you mentioned, how do you think uh, conservatives should champion this focus to win over support domestically? Okay, uh, both of those questions are from uh, my beloved and mischievous former colleague. Uh, uh, only Senator. one, only one. Uh, okay. I won't okay. say which. Okay. I mean, I already did. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it up with you afterward. Um, uh, changes. Um, first, a couple of ob observations, and then I'll mention, emphasize, but, but one change because time is short. Um, the State Department is a massive bureaucracy. It suffers from all the pathologies of massive bureaucracies 
and a few additional ones. Um, uh, it, uh, I think it is especially difficult for um, Republican administrations to maneuver within the State Department. Um, I think that um, incoming uh, Republican administrations should understand that that's baked into the cake, that they should, uh, that they should plan on that. Uh, I should also, I really should emphasize that there are, um, I've emphasized the pathologies of the, uh, of the State Department as a bureaucracy, but there are, there are countless um, career foreign service officers and civil servants who are, who, um, who are attempting to uh, advance the interests of the United States as they, as they understand them. Still, they're part of a bureaucracy. Republicans need to take that into account. Um, here's one change that we worked on at policy planning. We encountered many roadblocks. Um, I think it's crucial. We, Amanda, we've, we've already discussed it. The policy planning staff, you'll recall, we, we initiated, uh, Secretary Pompeo endorsed um, building up the ability, uh, the abilities of uh, State Department officials in the area of foreign languages. We met considerable resistance to that. Um, I, I actually, I believe that um, uh, not only this State Department, but uh, Congress and the executive branch ought to, be, um, ought to be creating programs that provide incentives for uh, young Americans, high school, college, to, uh, to acquire uh, serious abilities in these critical foreign languages this is likely to significantly improve our understanding of both strategic competitors uh, and, and friends. If we had time, there's a list uh, of, uh, of longer, longer reforms. But, but the bottom line is you should understand the State Department and how it works before you arrive. You don't want to spend months or years um, learning how to work within the bureaucracy, because by the time you do that, your time in office will have, have nearly expired. Um, the, the second question was? Uh, the second question related to your comments on securing freedom, how do you think conservatives should champion this focus to win over support domestically? Uh, again, I, I think um, the, the language of championing freedom, securing freedom, explaining how any particular policy um, creates conditions around the world that makes American freedom more secure it is a winner. So um, here's an example, um, trade policy. Sometimes President Trump would explain um, that he's not against trade policies, uh, tra sorry, trade deals. He's against trade, he's, in, he's against trade, trade deals that disadvantage America. He wants trade deals that advantage America, that, it, that is make America more secure. I think that kind of language uh, resonates, a vague America foreign policy for a middle class, which then maintains the policies that damage the middle class um, uh, are no good. But again, abstract language naming various um, schools of foreign policy thought, I think uh, will not help. I wanna make one more quick, if I may, quick point here. Um, Foreign policy um, inevitably, to borrow a phrase that I heard from you recently, um, is inevitably an elite sport or to some extent. Why is that? Take kitchen table issues, inflation, employment, taxation, to some extent immigration, education today we see. You don't have to read the newspapers to know that prices are rising in the markets. You don't have to read the newspapers to know whether you've got a job or your children have jobs or your parents have jobs. However, to understand what's going on along uh, Ukraine's border with Russia and Belarus, you depend on experts. You depend on journalists and you depend on foreign policy experts because these are places that many Americans have through no fault of their own, ha have never been or for that matter, Tehran, or for that matter, Taiwan or, or Beijing. We inevitably depend on experts, but over the last 20 or 30 years, the expert class, both journalists and, uh, and in foreign policy, have to a significant extent discredited themselves. So 
it's all the more important, I think, for um, those who wish to make the case for foreign policy to American people. By the way, at the end, um, they hold political official, officials accountable, is to make the case in language that ordinary voters can understand and the language of securing freedom at home, creating conditions abroad that are favorable to American freedom, and then explaining how this policy or that uh, advances freedom at home. That's intelligible, I believe, to, to ordinary American voters. And uh, I, I encourage all of us to adopt that language. Well, Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a wonderful and quite lively discussion. So we, we greatly appreciate it. Um, and thanks to our audience for joining us again for the series on the future of conservative uh, foreign policy. I just want to do a little plug based on one of Peter's comments about making sure you learn how the State Department works before you get there, that uh, here at Vandenberg, we are working on uh, what we're tentatively calling a bureaucracy working group, which needs a more catchy title, but is focused on exactly this question of preparing um, future leaders to learn the ins and outs of the National Security Council, the State Department, the Department of Defense, so that uh, we can shorten that learning curve when folks uh, get to these places, hopefully sometime soon. And uh, in the coming weeks, we'll also be joined by uh, Nadia Shado, who will be, we hope at that point, discussing the, uh, the Biden administration's national security strategy, which we hope to see soon. So uh, we welcome all of you to come back for those events as well. And thank you, Peter, so much. It was an honor to have you here today, and it was a, a great discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Amanda.